really exciting to have uh, Christopher Free here. He, um, I'm very excited because uh, he got his PhD at uh, Rutgers University, which is my alma mater as well. So, <laughs> all right, yeah, all right, let's hear it for Rutgers. So Chris developed his interest in quantitative ecology at Middlebury College, where he received a BA in conservation biology and studied the population dynamics and sustainable management of tropical trees. After graduating, he continued his work with funding from the U.S. Forest Service, worked on seabird conservation at Audubon, Alaska, and worked as a fisheries field technician at the Dauphin Island Sea Lab. He did his PhD with Olaf Jensen at Rutgers University, where he worked on small-scale fisheries management, data-limited stock assignment, and impacts of climate change on global fisheries. At Sustainable Fisheries Group, Chris will be working to assess the impact of climate change and management reform on country levels, fisheries, health, and profitability. And that is right here at UCSB. So please join me in welcoming Christopher Free. Thanks a lot for the introduction, Greg. Do you want to lead the Rutgers fight song, or should I? Um, <laughs> Uh, and thanks a lot to uh, Rita and Liz and Jordan for organizing this talk tonight and all of you for coming out and uh, braving the blustery conditions outside. Um, I really cannot imagine a better venue for coming to talk about the importance of commercial fisheries and the importance of figuring out how to manage commercial fisheries under the pressures of climate change. Um, if you had the chance to look at any of the exhibits during the, during the reception or look out, at the, the fleet in the harbor right outside our door, it should be immediately obvious to you um, just how important fishing has been to Santa Barbara for a very long time. Uh, right outside the door, we have uh, 60 to 80 fishing boats uh, that are supporting the livelihoods of uh, approximately 200 uh, fishing families. They're catching about six to eight uh, six to 10 million pounds of seafood, seafood annually, and, and that brings uh, 30, 30 million dollars uh, annually to the local, um, uh, local community. And I think it's important to recognize that, 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 that those livelihoods are supported and that revenue is generated is not just going uh, to the fishers, but also to people who work down the value chain, uh, who work at processors, who work at distributors, and work at restaurants. Um, so, so fishing is really, uh, has been a lifeblood of this community for a long time, um, and it's been a lifeblood of, of the national economy and, and, and people across the U.S. for a long time as well. Um, so this is a, a map from a, a, a NOAA fisheries report that came out in 2016, uh, showing just how many uh, fishing jobs are supported around the country. Uh, 1.7 million uh, jobs in the U.S. created from the fishing industry. And you'll see uh, proudly that California uh, is, is number two with 142,000 jobs um, after, after Florida, which probably has um, larger, larger recreational fisheries, which can be really interesting because they additionally support tackle shops and bait shops and um, um, the sort of travel industries surrounding um, fishing harbors. And finally, uh, scaling up even further, uh, fisheries are really, really important globally um, as, as a source of income. They support over 40 million jobs around the globe. Um, and they're also a really important source of food and nutrition. Um, and this is, a, this is a map that's showing uh, country level dependence on marine ecosystems as a source of, of, of uh, income and food and coastal protection. And you'll see that um, you know the United States is a is a is a little is a yellow, so you know not as as dependent on marine ecosystems as as countries in Western Africa and uh, Southeast Asia. And I want you to hold this map in your mind throughout the talk um, because it turns out that many of these countries that are highly uh, 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 um, dependent on marine ecosystems are also some of the countries that are the most vulnerable uh, to climate change. And I'm going to focus a lot of this talk um, um, on how uh, we've learned that and also how we can develop solutions for, for uh, meeting um, food production goals in these countries under, under climate change. Um, so, so I think 
uh, something that often gets missed when, when talking about climate change is remembering that it's, it's not something that's just happening now and is going to happen into the future, but it's actually something that's already been happening uh, for a long time. So this, this plot right here is from um, the, the most recent IPCC report on climate change, and it's showing uh, trends in ocean temperature from 1950 uh, to present, and that's in that uh, brown shading. Um, and then projections of ocean temperature through time under two different emission scenarios. So that, that, that red scenario is, is representative of business as usual. If we continue to um, pollute the atmosphere at the same rate we are today. Um, um, and the, the second scenario is representative of, of an aggressive emissions reduction. Um, and if you've been following the news, this is uh, an emissions reduction that's consistent with uh, the, the, Paris, um, the Paris Accords. Um, and, and what I'm going to really try to focus on um, today is, is trying to sort of help build some intuition about why climate change might affect marine fisheries. Um, and look at into the past at how climate change has already affected fisheries around the globe to see what we can learn from that, um, that experience uh, for preparing for the future. Um, in the second half of the talk, I'm going to talk about a lot of the work that's been done, uh, projecting future impacts of climate change on fisheries and some of the solutions for mitigating those, those impacts. So here we are, we're located right on the sort of boundary of the world, uh, Santa, Santa Barbara Maritime Museum, right um, at the edge of, edge of land and water. And for those of you who have been living um, in Santa Barbara for a long time, I, I've only been here for a year, so I haven't quite experienced this yet, but you, you uh, might have experienced climate change already. Um, so this is, this is a, a, a figure that's showing uh, temperatures over time in Santa Barbara County. And you can see that in the past uh, 35 years or so, air temperatures have warmed um, gradually from about 50 deg degrees Fahrenheit uh, average over the course of the year to uh, probably about like 56, 57 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and as that, that is projected to continue. Uh, and these, these, temp these trends in, in air temperature um, are, are contributing globally to changes in uh, ocean ecosystems, and it's those ecosystems that I'm gonna focus on, um, focus on today. So I, I've talked a lot about already um, how climate change is going to affect marine fisheries, and so I wanna, I wanna work a little bit to build some intuition about, about why. Why are fish responding to uh, changing ocean temperatures? And uh, that's because fish, like any other organisms, um, um, have a temperatures that they can, they can tolerate. So that's depicted here in this little chart, where this, uh, this hypothetical species um, uh, can tolerate temperatures as low as uh, zero degrees Fahrenheit. Um, it can tolerate temperatures as high as 100 degrees Fahrenheit, but its optimum temperature is somewhere around here. And the shape of this curve is pretty common across organisms where you see um, uh, this trade-off in, in, in the fitness of the individual or its ability to survive is sort of gradually declining towards that minimum temperature, but it really steeply declines uh, towards that maximum temperature. And what this tells you about climate change is that every degree of warming away from that optimum temperature is pushing these spe uh, species closer and closer to the maximum temperature. Uh, and now every species has a different thermal tolerance curve. So uh, this one might be representative of, of me when I was a graduate student in New Jersey and had a much higher tolerance to uh, cold temperatures. So this is me, you know, out in the snow without, uh, without gloves in a t-shirt. Um, and uh, I, could, I could tolerate a much wider a range of, of temperatures. Um, uh, but now that I've moved to Santa Barbara and have to run uh, with gloves, even in sunny Santa Barbara, uh, I might have a much uh, narrower temperature tolerance. Um, and and if, if these were not, you know, me, but actual fish out there, um, you could use this to infer how climate change might affect two species differently. Uh, so for example, that, that, that species, the, the New Jersey crisps with a, with a wide temperature tolerance, 
um, has a thermal sort of safety margin that's, that's fairly wide. Uh, so every degree of, of warming um, uh, doesn't result in that much precipitous decline in, in fitness or performance. Uh, but Santa Barbara, Chris, uh, as it gets warmer, I get hotter and hotter and hotter, uh, and, and my performance really declines. Um, so now, if we map this to, to fish out in the ocean, um, uh, this provides a sort of basis for determining how they can adapt, adapt to warming. Um, so physiologically, there's, there's um, a wide range of, of temperatures that the fish can tolerate. Um, if temperature goes up, they might have to alter their behavior to go and find cooler waters, go and find warmer waters. Uh, this is often done by moving up and down in the water column. Um, if, if, if moving up and down in the water column is insufficient, uh, a fish might need to follow its uh, preferred temperatures by moving farther and colonizing new spaces in the ocean that are preferable. Uh, another alternative is, is to acclimate slowly to these changes in temperature uh, uh, through sort of plasticity, so to become a slightly different uh, organism. Um, and, and at the extreme example, fish can go, undergo evolution to, to increase their tolerance to warming temperatures. But, but these adaptation measures might not always be fully effective um, um, and, and might allow uh, fish populations, fish to survive in warming waters, but at the cost of reduced performance. Uh, and it could also lead uh, to local extinction or, or, or global extinction in the worst case scenario if they're unable to uh, adapt to, to warming temperatures. Um, out of curiosity, how many people here participate in, in Get Hooked, the, the local seafood? Okay, one? Okay. Well, this is what we're eating tomorrow night. This is uh, California halibut. Um, um, now, now, this sort of illustrates how uh, uh, gnarly these problems can be for, for the fishers whose livelihoods depend on these resources and also the managers who are uh, tasked with trying to figure out how to, to sustainably manage ocean fisheries. And it becomes particularly complex when you start thinking about whole ecosystems and the interactions in between uh, predators and prey or competitors and how these are all changing uh, under climate change. And then thinking about um, um, the, the, the fisheries targeting them. That hopefully was helpful in sort of building an intuition about why climate change matters to fish and fish populations. Um, and now we're gonna take a look into the evidence for how historical warming uh, has already affected fish populations around the globe. Um, and Greg, here's another Rutgers connection. This is a work done by one of my PhD committee members, Malin Pinsky. Um, and they took a look at all the data that comes out of the scientific uh, trawl surveys that are happening in every single major marine ecosystem along our coast. Uh, and it's been happening since the 1960s through uh, present. And they looked at how uh, the center of fish populations have shifted over time and how those shifts have related to the temperature experience of those fish. So in this map, every single dot represents a single fish species sampled in one of those ecoregions. Uh, and the arrow shows the movement over time of that fish population. And the big black arrows show the general trend uh, uh, in each of those regions. So uh, for example, over here in the California Current, uh, they documented a slight uh, southward trend um, in, in the center of gravity of these fish populations. And they related those movements to um, uh, how temperature has changed over time and showed that on average, fish populations are tracking very closely uh, the changes in their preferred temperatures. So in this, in this plot right here on the x-axis, you have how many degrees north uh, the fish population shifted over time, or sorry, the uh, temperature has changed over time related to how many degrees north the taxa has changed over time. And, and they match really closely along that one-to-one that -one line. So fish are very closely tracking their preferred temperatures. Uh, the large arrow represents the average for the whole region, so cumulative fish species in that region. Uh, each of the individual points and in arrows represents a single 
uh, fish species. Um, and so each one of these dots also rep rep represents a single uh, species in the, in an ecoregion. And so these, these ones down here are kind of interesting to think about because they represent uh, fish populations that are lagging behind uh, their preferred temperatures and may not be able to keep up uh, with climate change. Really interestingly, uh, fishers are also moving to follow uh, uh, the fish as they shift over time, uh, but there's some differences among regions and also among uh, sort of the capacity of, of the vessels targeting these fish. Uh, so this is work done by uh, one of my um, uh, graduate school lab mates, Talia Young, and, and down here you can see that this uh, uh, community of large vessels leaving Beaufort, North Carolina, uh, have gradually shifted their fishing grounds northward over time uh, uh, following the, the fish species that they target. Uh, meanwhile, this fishing community up in Portland, Maine, hasn't shown as much uh, close tracking of the fish that they target. And, and that's because they uh, participate in much more multi-species fisheries and so uh, uh, don't have to work as hard to go out and, 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 and follow their catch. Um, and, and this can be a real challenge because this can, you might mean um, uh, sort of being away from your families for a longer period of time, relocating your families, uh, and being at sea for a longer time and maybe not netting as much, as much profits. Um, and really interestingly too, uh, small, smaller vessels show less flexibility to be able to uh, follow their, the target species as they're shifting through time. So a similar community down in Engelhard, North Carolina, defined by, by small fishing vessels, has shown much less uh, expansion, uh, expansion through time. So we've just learned that uh, warming can drive shifts in where fish live in the ocean. Uh, there's also a lot of physiological theory to suggest that warming can change the, the maximum body size attained, attained by fish. And the idea here is that as temperatures go up, uh, water can hold less oxygen, and larger fish require more oxygen to survive. Uh, so to adapt to um, uh, changing oxygen levels, fish will, fish will actually get smaller. Uh, and there's some work that's come out of the North Sea looking at uh, a bunch of really important commercially fish species there that, that has documented this trend empirically. So I'm just showing uh, uh, four selected species here, um, um, or four selected populations. Uh, we've got northern whiting, southern whiting, uh, male place, and female place, and they're all showing declines in, in body size over time um, as temperatures warmed in those places. And the final mechanism I want to highlight about how um, ocean warming can affect fish populations um, uh, is, is one called changing phenology. And phenology is a word that uh, biologists use to talk about the, the, the timing of different life history events. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to cheat on the ocean briefly. And uh, I'm using an example here from, from terrestrial systems. Um, but you can imagine that the uh, biomass of caterpillars or the time of caterpillar hatching is, is connected to a, a, a temperature cue that tells them it's a good, time, a good time to hatch. And birds that depend on those caterpillars as prey uh, have evolved to, to time the date of, of their egg laying so that uh, uh, the hatching time is timed with the availability of that important, of that important um, uh, prey item. So uh, the, as uh, hatchling progresses uh, from you know, uh, birth to uh, fledging, it's timed with this peak in the availability of, of caterpillar prey. And if, uh, uh, if climate change is changing the date where this peak occurs, uh, and, and birds are able to um, also change, read into sort of similar cues and change uh, the, date, the date of egg laying to maintain that timing, then maybe climate change has no impact. But uh, uh, if birds are cueing to some sort of different signal and maintaining their uh, same date of egg laying, uh, then you could have this myth, and, and climate change is causing 
uh, the peak in, in caterpillar biomass to shift earlier. This could cause a mismatch in the time of hatching and the availability of prey, and that would be really bad for all of the, the baby birds. So it's easy to sort of map this example onto um, uh, marine ecosystems where maybe you have uh, uh, the fish uh, spawning times to uh, uh, when zooplankton prey, these tiny little animals in the water, um, are, are peaking in abundance. And, and there is a lot of empirical evidence uh, of, this, of this in the literature as well. So this is a study where each bar represents a, a different species of phytoplankton, different species of zooplankton, or fish, or seabird. And uh, how its uh, date of peak abundance has changed over the past five or so decades. Um, and you see that uh, many are moving earlier, some are moving later. Uh, and these black bars indicate um, species where they did not move in the direction that would have been predicted by the change in temperature. So this is to show that, um, um, there, that this, this phenomenon has pretty, pre pretty widespread in, in, in marine ecosystems. Hopefully up until this point, I've um, convinced you that uh, fisheries are a really crucial source of, of food and income around the world. Um, and that the ocean has already warmed considerably, and that this warming has driven changes in the distribution and life history of, of ocean fish. But, but what I haven't quite answered yet is how all of those net changes, how those changes in distribution and those changes in the timing of life history events and changes in body size all add up together to uh, alter the amount of catch that is available uh, for fishers and for the people who depend on, 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 on fish for consumption. Um, so this is some work that I tackled during my, uh, my dissertation at Rutgers, go Rutgers. Um, um, and uh, we wanted to understand how uh, warming has already changed the amount of catch that could be sustainably removed from the ocean um, over the last seven decades. And so we used a, a, a massive database of of estimates of fish population abundance worldwide and matched that up with maps of how temperature has changed uh, through time. And we did this for 235 different fish populations, representing about 33% about of, of fish that are targeted for fisheries around the world. Um, and in this plot, every single one of those points represents a single fish population. And points uh, that are in the area that is negative are populations that have been negatively affected by warming. Um, and, and the points that are positive are populations that have been, uh, that have actually benefited, benefited from warming. Um, but we did a lot of work to account for uncertainty. So you see uh, uh, sort of our confidence in each one of those estimates expressed as a, as a line around those points. And only the ones that we're really confident in, they're statistically significant, um, are, are colored. So we found that um, 19 populations around the world have been negatively impacted um, by historical warming. And, and nine populations around the world have been uh, positively Im impacted by warming. Um, and when you look at this, when you look at this diagram, it looks uh, sort of like roughly symmetrical, like the, the winners might balance out the losers. Uh, but it turns out that the populations that have been negatively impacted by climate change um, are, are generally larger, and that globally we've actually seen a, a 4% decline in how much fish you could sustainably extract uh, from the ocean since 1930. So among these evaluated fish populations, uh, we had a global sustainable catch level of 35.2 million metric tons in 1930, uh, to today is 33.8 million metric tons. Um, and that, that might sound small, but remember that's um, you know, millions of, of metric tons of food uh, that is no longer available to be eat, eaten and sold. And, and these impacts have really varied uh, uh, around the world as well. So this map is showing the, the impact of, of historical ocean warming on um, fisheries in different ecosystems around the world. And the areas that are shown in red have been negatively impacted by historical warming, and the areas in blue have benefited from warming, and the size of the circle represents just how important uh, that fishery is, how big it is. 
Um, and, and some things that pop out over, over here in the California current, we haven't actually seen much change in uh, uh, available fisheries for, for capture. Uh, we also actually haven't seen that much warming in the California current. It might be a place in the world where uh, increased upwelling is increased, is, has led to cooling over this past time. Um, but but uh, these areas uh, in Eastern Asia, which support some of the fastest growing human populations in the world, have been really negatively uh, hit by climate change. And these areas in, in Europe that support really important commercial fisheries have, have been really heavily hit by climate change. So this is a, a challenge uh, for fisheries managers going forward. Um, and one uh, really interesting finding from our study um, is highlighted here, and it's a kind of a complicated plot, so I'm gonna take a, take a second to walk through it. But, but on the, on the x-axis, we have how much temperature change each of the populations experienced. So if you're over here below zero, uh, you experienced cooling. If you're over here above zero, that population experienced warming. And this is a metric of fishing pressure. If you're above one, then overfishing has been happening in that population for a very long time. And if the value is below one, then that population has been sort of somewhere between well-managed or, or, or even underfished. And, and what you notice is that these deep red points represent the historical impact of warming, and they're all concentrated up in this quadrant of, of, of rapid warming and, and heavy historical overfishing. Um, so so we, learned, we learned two things from this. One is that uh, overfished populations are, are more vulnerable to climate change, but also well-managed populations are more resilient to climate change. So this gives us a really sort of hopeful message going forward that if we can uh, sort of pr uh, prevent overfishing and rebuild overfished fish populations, we'll uh, inherently be uh, establishing more resilience to, to future climate change. So now I want to move into um, uh, talking about how scientists have forecasted um, um, the uh, future impacts of climate change on fisheries and start talking about some of the opportunities to, to uh, mitigate those, those impacts. So a really, a really amazing study came out um, um, this spring uh, understanding how climate change is likely to impact uh, uh, fisheries in the future is a, is a really important question. That means that a lot of people have tried to answer it. And uh, a study came out this spring that sought to uh, ensemble or sort of average the, the estimated impacts of future climate change on fisheries from all of these different models and create a new uh, sort, of, sort of authoritative estimate about how uh, fisheries biomass is likely to change, change through time. Um, so these are, these are their projections shown here. So they, they show um, uh, their model sort of estimated uh, a 4% decline um, in fisheries uh, biomass uh, from 1970 to 2010, which was really great for me to see because it lined up really well uh, with, with my study results. Um, and, and they looked at how biomass is likely to change under a bunch of different sort of future emission scenarios. And I highlighted two at the beginning. One is, is that business as usual emissions, where they forecast a 17% a decrease in fish biomass by the end of the century, um, compared with a 5% reduction uh, in fish biomass by the end of the century if we were to aggressively curb uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So this sort of immediately highlights the importance of, of taking actions to, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, um, because it will um, make sure that fish are available as a resource into the future. And they also uh, sort of averaged out projections of how uh, biomass is likely to change across ocean basins. Um, and, and this is under that aggressive emissions reduction scenario where you see sort of cooler colors compared to, to business as usual. So you don't see as large of negative impacts or as large of positive impacts around the world. And you see general patterns of, of poleward countries uh, 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 gaining biomass as, as fish populations are moving north to track their preferred temperatures. Um, and equatorward countries are, are losing biomass as those fish populations are moving north to track their preferred temperatures. 
Um, so this, this again sort of highlights uh, the importance of really reducing emissions, uh, not only to um, mitigate the net amount of fish lost, but also the, the inequity of who suffers those losses. Uh, so right now, uh, you know, under business as usual emissions, you see really, really great losses of fish biomass in the, uh, uh, in the tropics uh, and, and in Europe, and, and these large gains in, in, in parts of uh, the, the, the poles. Um, but but in, in some ways, this, these projections are a little bit pessimistic because they're simply accounting for how the underlying biology is, is changing. And they're not accounting for how we as humans might be able to respond uh, to those changes and also uh, correct our previous errors. And, and as we learned from um, um, the sort of looking into the past, we saw that uh, uh, overfished populations have been among the most vulnerable to climate change. And there are a lot of overfished populations around the globe. And if we are able to uh, end overfishing and, and rebuild uh, uh, overfish populations, we might actually be able to have more catch in the future relative to today uh, by, by extending that sort of long-term uh, catch, catch available. Um, so this is, this is a sort of a, a plot illustrating that point where we're seeing the proportion of global fisheries, they're estimated by the FAO to be overfished through time. Um, and I think it's hovering today around 30% uh, of, of populations are estimated to be overfished. So we could really increase the long-term um, uh, yields, the long-term catch from, from fisheries by, by rebuilding these populations. And sort of likewise, likewise there are opportunities to uh, uh, increase exploitation uh, sustainably for, for historically underfished or underutilized uh, resources. And that might be able to help mitigate impacts of climate change around the world. Um, the other problem that we're going to need to address is uh, uh, shifting distributions, and I think this, this animation really captures that nicely. This is for Peruvian anchoveta, which is, uh, which is a small fish but supports the world's uh, largest fishery. Um, um, if you, you know, use any like, fish oil supplements, it's probably coming from Peruvian anchoveta. And what you see here is projected through time, the, the range of Peruvian anchoveta is, is, is moving um, uh, poleward, moving southward in this case, and exiting the uh, management area of, of, of Peru and entering, and entering Chile. Um, and this, this presents a sort of challenging management scenario where what, what is to incentivize Peru from, from not overfishing that resource as it exits its waters? Um, and, and if they're not adequately sharing information right now, uh, how is Chile able to adequately prepare for um, um, receiving um, this, this burgeoning fishery. Um, so, so there are two human responses that could happen here. We could have a maladaptive response where you fail to do either one of those things, and that could exacerbate um, the, the climate challenge presented here. Or you could um, uh, have an adaptive response where you have international Co cooperation between uh, Peru and Chile that uh, allows for the sustainable management of this stock even as it shifts waters into, into another country. So we evaluated um, um, the potential for these types of actions to, to, to mitigate effects of climate change. And to do this, we had to develop our own model that forecasts um, um, fisheries biomass into the future. And so we have a similar map that I showed earlier with a bunch of um, uh, a loss in the, in the developing tropics and gains in poleward countries. Uh, but if you were to implement fisheries reforms that accounted for these shifts and uh, allowed for management to remain as, as stocks shift boundaries, um, you could actually see the reversal of, of many of these climate trends and certainly um, uh, the reduction of some of these negative impacts. So just to highlight a few examples for you, I've put stars and stars in sort of countries and regions that uh, would be projected to lose biomass under climate change, but where reforms could actually maintain or increase uh, catch into the future. Um, but even with these perfect 
idealized reforms in, in, in fisheries management, there are a bunch of regions of the world uh, that will still be unable to uh, generate as much catch and profits from, the fish from fisheries um, as, as they are today. And, and unfortunately, those are also regions of the world that are, that are projected to see the greatest um, reductions in, in agriculture um, productivity as well. So there's this perfect storm of, of, of climate impacts um, across uh, food systems in Western Africa and Southeast Asia and, and parts of South America. And there's been a whole, so our team and other people at UCSB have been uh, really excited about uh, evaluating the potential for aquaculture, sustainable aquaculture, or the farming of, of, of fish in the ocean to, to offset these losses. Um, and we've been looking at two different types of, of offshore aquaculture. One is for uh, bivalves like oysters and mussels and clams, uh, which don't require any uh, feed inputs. You, you, you hang them out there in bags on lines or um, um, in, in bags on these uh, floating racks, and they're able to filter feed from, from the, 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 the surrounding environment. And also, finfish aquaculture, um, uh, which requires uh, feed from, that's produced from mean fishery, marine fisheries and, and is therefore somewhat capped by the, the productivity of, 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 of wild capture fisheries. Um, and, and we're really excited about understanding the potential for these uh, sort of sustainable designs of marine aquaculture to offset losses around the world. And this has really been pioneered by uh, uh, Becca Gentry and Holly Furlick, who are um, um, associated with the UCSB community. Um, and they, this is a map showing uh, they've, they've mapped out the, suit, the suitability of every single cell in the ocean for, for offshore um, aquaculture. Um, and, and we've been extending their work uh, to uh, account for impacts of climate change, so to see how that suitability changes as temperature changes, as pH changes, as um, salinity changes, and dissolved oxygen changes. Um, and also to account for places where uh, it's not realistic, economically realistic, for, for uh, aquaculture to occur. So many of these very distant offshore areas might be totally unprofitable to, to um, develop for aquaculture. And, and also I mentioned earlier that uh, fish aquaculture requires this input of feed um, um, that is reliant on fish captured in, in wild fisheries. And so that also caps the um, production potential for, for fish aquaculture. And, and we're really, we've been really excited to find that even after accounting for those uh, additional constraints, that there's really high potential for um, uh, the expansion of mariculture, aquaculture if we uh, uh, sort of jointly uh, reform capture fisheries to increase the amount of feed that's available, and we uh, uh, take some sort of basic steps in, in reforming um, the use of feed in, in fish aquaculture. So this is a, a map that's basically showing that um, uh, you can have high aquaculture potential in, in, in nearly every country in the world. Um, and, and, and finally, we've, we've, we've matched this with our projections of of the impact of climate change on fisheries to see can this aquaculture development really offset losses in, in food from capture fisheries. And this is a, a, a really exciting map um, whoop, I, that is showing um, uh, by the end of the century under, um, um, I think this is the highest emission scenario, uh, the countries that could be uh, net winners across sectors if they uh, reformed fisheries and expanded aquaculture, sustainable aquaculture. Uh, countries, and those are in blue, um, countries where the expansion of sustainable aquaculture, aquaculture could offset losses in, in capture fisheries in green, and then uh, a, a limited number of countries where um, um, neither one of those reforms would be sufficient um, to, to maintain uh, food production into the future. Um, so I'm just going to uh, briefly conclude before we hand out the tests. Um, and uh, uh, so climate change is going to reduce the, the catch potential of global fisheries. Uh, 
poleward countries are likely to see an increase in catch potential while equatorward countries are going to see declines. Um, reforms in fisheries management that uh, uh, end overfishing account for shifts in productivity and use uh, international cooperation to maintain sustainable management could reduce the impact of climate change but it will be insufficient in um, uh, some countries still. Uh, in many of those countries, expansion of sustainable aquaculture could offset those losses. Uh, and, and, and lastly, I do want to underscore the fact that um, these reforms, I, you know, I've, I've, these reforms um, uh, become less effective uh, and increasingly difficult to implement and uh, uh, under increasingly severe emissions scenarios and, and result in, in, in less equitable outcomes. So uh, first and foremost, while reforming fisheries and expanding mariculture, uh, we really are going to have to um, uh, curb, curb emissions. Um, so uh, thanks for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. So he was asking about um, the chart where uh, I showed that um, fish are estimated to be moving generally southward in the California current uh, and was correctly pointing out examples um, where fish are moving, moving northward. And uh, part, part of that observation is the fact that fish are also uh, moving into deeper waters um, to, to maintain um, uh, their preferred temperatures. So, so that trend is sort of is, is getting captured into that measurement of, of latitude movement. Um, and, and, and partially, too, that uh, that was an examination of, of every species targeted in the, the NOAA trawl surveys. Um, so it's not necessarily representative of every single uh, uh, commercial, commercial fishery. Um, and there have been sort of revisitations, technical things to the statistical methods used uh, in, in, that, in that paper as well. Um, but there are certainly many examples of, of northward migrations in the California current. So that's a great question. So um, she asked if I could uh, more clearly define aquaculture and if the United States was a leader in, in aquaculture. And, and aquaculture is basically um, the farming of, of fish out in the ocean. So it's actually the cultivation, rather than going out and cap capturing in the wild, you're cultivating them right there in place. Um, Oh, so, so when it's in the ocean, it's called mariculture. Um, um, and, and the United States is not currently uh, a, a leader in aquaculture. And part of these, um, um, the expansion of, of, of the su sustainable mariculture I was talking about is going to require sort of highly regulated countries like the United States to sort of establish uh, sort of more clear um, permitting uh, criteria for aquaculture operators. Um, and and um, to, to sort of help foster that growth. Um, right, right now, our, our policies have, have been uh, a little bit convoluted uh, uh, and unclear. And in other parts of the world, um, promoting sustainable aquaculture is gonna require the opposite. It's gonna require correcting um, unsustainable practices. Totally, so the, 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 the question was um, um, that you know, pollution is a big problem um, around the world and could be um, uh, and is it accounted for in these sort of analyses? And, and this, this is in some ways is, is, is reassuring because there are multiple stressors out there. Uh, and some of those stressors might be easier to tackle than um, climate change. So pollution, for example, if we were able to solve pol the pollution problems in some of these places, that would likely result in gains that could uh, help offset some of the more tricky problems that are presented by, by climate change. Um, um, so so it's, 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 not, it's not represented in these analyses um, and, and uh, ways in which it could alter them is, is that maybe the, the benefits of, of reform might actually be smaller if you haven't solved the pollution problem, um, but uh, maybe the, bene the impacts of climate change would actually be sort of smaller too if you were you were able to, to solve them. Um, so his question was about um, uh, the sort of biogeographic break that's presented by points, sir, and change in current direction and, and, and how um, um, that might affect movement of fish. And I, I, the answer is I don't know, but there's a PhD student um, at, at UC Santa Barbara, Barbara who is presenting in a couple of weeks who's been really interested in the role of, of, of biogeographic breaks and, 
and how um, they might hinder um, sort of movements that are required. Um, but but I, I don't know the answer to the question. Uh, the question was, um, what are, what are the prospects for countries who are losing um, access to capture fisheries um, and uh, replacing that with, with land-based aquaculture? And, uh, and you correctly pointed out. Exactly, exactly. And that, that my analysis was only looking at um, uh, offshore marine aquaculture. And, and, and there probably is um, some ability to do it. But but um, there's been a lot of work into looking at the sort of environmental impacts of different food production systems. And, and uh, capture fisheries is actually really low uh, environmental impact in terms of um, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, in terms of uh, water usage. And offshore mariculture, especially for bivalves, is very low in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and, and water usage. And, and the problem with um, uh, sort of expansions in, in land-based aquaculture has been uh, like land conversion for, for building those facilities and then the extreme water requirements of running those facilities. And they start to compete with other forms of, um, of, of protein production in the land. So I think, um, I think, I think like any sort of problem, we need, a, we need a portfolio of solutions, and, and land-based aquaculture will certainly be one. But mariculture is exciting because of its low, um, relatively low environmental impact. Uh, so the question was um, about um, the role of, of, of Great Lakes fisheries um, and impacts of climate change on Great Lakes fisheries. And I'm going to sort of expand the question outside of, you know, the, the Laurentian Great Lakes right here in North America to sort of freshwater systems all around the world. Um, here, here in North America, they're not a, a huge source of, of, of food, um, but in other parts of the world, like in the, the Mekong Delta um, and in um, um, like um, the Great Lakes of Africa, um, uh, those are hugely important um, sources of, of, of food. Um, and I haven't worked on them, and, I'm, and I don't know exactly what the prognosis is, but, but they're definitely really, really important in those parts of the world. Whether or not we're accounting for sort of like habitat loss um, and, and, and the role that habitat plays, especially in like uh, uh, rearing juvenile fish um, in these projections, and we're, we're not. Um, um, and, uh, but, but, but that's sort of like a shortcoming, that's a shortcoming of these, these global analyses that I presented, but there are a lot of people who are doing uh, sort of much more detailed work in um, um, other parts of the world um, um, that are accounting for that. So in the, in, in the US, for example, um, 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 you know, we have, we have some of the, the strongest fisheries legislation in the world, and one of the requirements is to uh, map essential fish habitat uh, for fish and to have efforts targeting, targeted at preserving those um, uh, essential fish habitats. So, so things like that are getting accounted for um, in, in decision processes. So, so marine protected areas definitely have a, oh, sorry, yeah. Um, um, I get so excited to answer the question. Um, the, the, the question was, um, Basically, uh, so what, what is the role that marine protected areas can play in uh, mitigating impacts of climate change? Um, um, and, and the answer is that they can be really helpful, and uh, especially because of this point of their role that they can play in helping to uh, sort of rebuild over fish stocks. And, and one of the most important roles they can play is to help uh, rebuild um, uh, age structure, size structure. So fisheries are selectively removing the largest individuals from the population, and those individuals are also the ones that have the greatest reproductive output and greatest ability to rebuild a population. So I think the most the sort of most promising opportunity for marine protected areas can be to, to sort of enhance resilience by rebuilding um, healthy age structures. Let's hear it for Christopher Green. Yeah.